4120, Serious Gaming and Simulations. Week 11, Assessment, Video Clip 2 of 3. I'm Professor Bill Kapralos, and over the next few minutes, I'll be discussing Assessing the Learning in Serious Games, and this is Part 1 of 2. However, prior to doing so, here's the list of analysis questions for this particular video clip. Number 1. What is completion assessment? Number two, what is in process assessment? Number three, what is teacher assessment? And finally, number four, what is pre and post testing? There are three primary types of assessment within serious games. This includes one, completion assessment, two, in process assessment, and three, teacher assessment. Let's take a closer look at completion assessment. Completion assessment is concerned with whether the player completes the game. In a traditional learning environment, this is equivalent to asking did the student get the right answer. A simple criterion such as this could be the first indicator that the student sufficiently understands the subject taught, albeit there are many problems using this measure alone. For example, players could cheat and it is hard to determine that the player actually learned the material or learned to complete the game. However, when we consider the learning within a serious game, it's probably safe to assume that not all learning objectives were met if the game has not been completed. In-process assessment examines how, when, and why a player made the choices that they did. And this is analogous to observation of the student by the educator as the student performs the task or takes the test in a traditional teaching environment. And finally, Teacher assessment focuses on the instructor's observations and judgments of the student in action, or in other words, while they are playing the game. Teacher assessment includes a combination of both completion assessment and in-process assessment, so essentially it's a combination of the two. Both in-process and teacher assessments can be accommodated by the use of commonly available technology. For example, it is now simple and cost-effective to obtain screen recordings of the player's gameplay, video recordings of the players while they are playing the game, and audio recordings to capture a player's voice, for example, during thinking aloud processes, which may happen unexpectedly or may also be encouraged as part of the process. With our current technology, information from these recordings can also be obtained automatically without the player being aware of it, using a wide variety of available tools. And the recordings, in addition to the information resulting from these recordings, can also be used to facilitate debriefing sessions. More recent assessment methods include what are known as information trails. These information trails consist of tracking a player's significant actions and events as they're progressing through the simulation or the game and they may aid in analyzing and answering the what, how, when, who, and where in the game something happened. Now, although this information cannot necessarily provide the reasons as to why a player selected a specific action or event, as opposed to some other action or event, as they're progressing through the simulation or the game, it is suggested that if that information is needed, it can be obtained through the players by explicitly asking them through a debriefing or interview session after they complete their gameplay session. Although various methods and techniques have been used to assess learning within a serious game and a simulation in general, assessment is commonly accomplished with the use of what's known as pre and post testing. Pre and post testing is a common approach in education or research and is certainly not specific to simulation and serious gaming. The pre and post test design is one of the most widely used experimental design and is particularly popular in educational studies that aim to measure changes in educational outcomes after modifications to the learning process, such as testing the effect of a new teaching method. Furthermore, this design is also commonly used to evaluate the effects of counseling, testing medical treatments, and measuring psychological constructs. Within a pre and post test design, participants are randomly allocated to either what's known as a treatment group or a control group. Both groups receive an identical pretest to gauge their prior knowledge and ultimately ensure that both groups are equivalent. 
Upon completion of this pretest, each group receives a different treatment, either the intervention being examined, and in the case of simulations in serious games, well, they will use the simulation of the serious game, or the usual treatment. And again, in the case of simulations in serious games, they won't be given and therefore won't play the simulation or the serious game, but rather they rely solely on traditional instructional approaches. Upon completion of the treatment, both groups are given the same post-test, and the results of the pre- and post-tests are compared across both groups. Differences in the scores across the groups are assumed to be a result of the treatment, or in other words, the serious game or the simulation. In a variant of this design, the pretesting is eliminated, and both groups are exposed to the usual treatment, while one of the groups will also receive the treatment itself, or in other words, the use of the simulation or the serious game. And upon completion of the treatment, both groups complete a post-test, and once again, significant differences across the test scores are attributed to the treatment itself, or in other words, the simulation or the serious game. Despite the widespread use of pre- and post-testing, there are a number of problems associated with it. Most importantly, it is impossible to determine whether the act of pre-testing influences any of the results. Furthermore, it is impossible and at times unethical to completely isolate all of the participants. For example, if two groups of child participants attend the same school, they will most likely interact outside of lessons, potentially influencing the results. Well, if the child participants are taken from different schools to prevent this, the randomization is not possible. This is the end of this video clip, and it brings us to our analysis questions. Number one, how can debriefing be realized within a serious game setting? Number two, aside from what was discussed within the video clip, what are some of the other issues with pre and post testing? This is the end of this video clip. Thank you.